I did this video nearly two months ago where I recounted my experiences of uh, at the Ganyawe community just out of Yukai, Chown Creek. Some of the locals in the area I've already heard know the place and know the Smiths boys. So for any of those cult members that want to know who I am and what kind of woman I am, tell you what, go up and ask them at Ganyawe. Ask them what kind of bitch I am. <laughs> they'll tell you. Trust me, they'll remember me. Very few people forget me once they get on the wrong side of me. But I digress because uh, the main center of my um, experience around the MK Ultra was it was uh, what uh, I think it was the end of 2015 now it had been what three four years before I'd first found out about super soldiers MK Ultra and all the mind control and I mean you watch these things and you you know that they're they exist and they're real but there's also this perception that it's outside of Australia it's not here you know and you kind of think well you know as long as it's not going on here you know I don't have to really <laughs> take it on board too much you know but um, when I moved into Gun Yahweh and I met this guy Alan Hamer that completely changed everything because of the experience that I had with him and everything that he came out and told me. Now I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of it if you wanted to go back and listen to the other one where I'm going where I explain it more about the experience but uh, the Alan Hamer that I knew these are more the images of him of how I recognize him sort of like a little golem <laughs> hunched over these uh he's got four channels uh this was six years ago three years ago two years ago love this one he does a video with something over his face <laughs> he likes to call himself king noddy of nod he's the black king He's got um, ancient DNA too that it makes him the king. The like, um, you know, Max Egan says that uh, Gunnam Buddy Jakamara is the accepted, you know, um, one that's going to bring the tribes together that the ancestors and all of that have been waiting for. Well, this guy Alan Hamer reckons it's him. You know, they've all got their own little story. But this is the guy that told me that um, we were sharing um, living quarters in this place at Ganyawe. Didn't like this guy at all. And it's early in the morning, it's only he and I up, and we're sitting outside on the veranda, and he just starts telling me. I don't know, something that I said must have triggered him, because um, he just turned around and he said, you're one of them. I said, what? You're one of them, aren't you? He then proceeded to tell me how um, he's pretty much an MK Ultra infiltrator. That um, they come in, they do it for two years. You see, as someone uh, left in a comment uh, a month or so ago, that um, the reason he was telling me this is because he perhaps thought I was his replacement. Because he not only told me who he was uh, and his code name, which is The Jester, but he also told me uh, other people that are involved. And he's been, he's telling me that for the last 20 years, these operatives have infiltrated every single alternative community in the Northern Rivers area. And he even said the Quakers at Bentley have been infiltrated. Every single alternative community mindset, no matter what philosophy, they have been infiltrated. And the way they do it, 
the way this guy explains it is they go in for two years. They get to know what's going on and then they move on. They're put into somewhere else and they drift around. Now, he was telling me this because like he was kind of having a little bit of a um, a glitch I think in the programming uh, as I explained it's the old MK Ultra programming where it's not as good as the new super soldier programming the personality glitches and it starts to break down and they need to go back in for retraining and this is pretty much what he said to me uh, that he was waiting for Paul his trainer to come in and pick him up to go back in for eight weeks training. Now Paul taught him everything that he knows before and all of them before they go in. And the interesting thing that I don't think I mentioned in the past video was that Paul is apparently a, a very talented remote viewer. And when I'm talking about talented remote viewer I'm thinking he's putting it in the class of, you know, the men who could stare at goats, the guy that actually stopped the goat's heart. I think he's putting him in that category of remote viewing. And we all know that the remote viewing is just the um, military term for ESP or um, any other skills that are inherent in human beings that we all have that we can actually develop but they just want to put a different name on it so it doesn't sound like you know all that stupid psychic stuff that isn't supposed to exist but it actually does and I know it does so um, this Paul comes in and he was waiting for Paul to come and pick him up to take him in for his eight, eight weeks training which I dare say is to re-imprint the personality type because it's glitching he needs to be put back on track and then he was telling me about how that I've also met another one of them and he said you've, you've met Frank and it's like yeah I remember Frank Frank's um he comes around with his banjo he comes around He'd bring a loaf of bread or some other thing, you know, he'd always be bringing food. And um, after this Alan Hamer told me this, it was like, yes, yeah, so I had seen Frank had come round a couple of times and he'd actually gone off with Alan Hamer and just the two of them. And after he told me this, I realised why they had done it. They were just going to have that private little chat between the two MK Ultra operatives because uh, Frank is his code name's the Birdman. I do know Frank's last name, but I can't remember it. But he was the one that I described that, um, well, apparently he lived in the back of his um, station wagon. He'd been um, squatting on national park land for the last six years, going for squatters' rights, and he used to just drift around all the communities. And, you know, when he'd come, he'd bring food. You know, it's funny that Max Egan said something about uh, food, whether that might have brought on his episode, you know, with people bringing him food all the time. Seems to be one of those things that might actually be associated with it. But then again, accepting food from strange people has been something, you know, people get poisoned. It's well known in history. They've been doing it for thousands of years. So there's Frank the Birdman, plays the banjo, he's a really tall guy, he, you know, he's, like most of these, as I said, are into their 60s by now, late 50s, early 60s, and um, they, like uh, Alan Hamer, I didn't have it confirmed until he left me a comment that he is ex-military as well. So um, there's Frank the Birdman, who's pretty much in the, the same category. And there's also a guy called Chris. He never gave me his last name. And last time I mentioned Brett the Spider, um, he told me his name was Brett McKinley. I don't know if that person even exists. I've never even checked him out. 
uh, that could just be another code name. I mean, Max Egan is uh, just a false name. So how many of these MK Ultra operatives are actually using false names? I don't know. And you see, it was because of my experience at Gonyawa with this Alan Hamer that um, when I saw Max Egan's video with Gonambari Jakamara and the Nightcap community, uh, it raised red flags with me. It real—I mean, it hadn't been sitting right with me. I mean, back in June, I think was the first time I'd come across Max Egan, you know, and everything that Max Egan knows, I've already known for years, and I've learned heaps more since then. You know, I could listen to the same recording of him ten years ago, and it's the same shit as it is today. It's just going round and round in circles, and it doesn't take long of listening to him. To realise that, well, seriously, you're going to say anything different? And really, you know, after you've, after I've finished listening, listening to you, I just feel so ugh. You're just constantly, always so negative, you know. And but anyway, we won't uh, get too much into that. It was because of um, when I checked out the Nightcap community because I'd been in the area and it was in the area and then I saw Dean Rodimer on the Nightcap video and it was like wow okay I've met Dean I know Dean he came up to Gunyawa a couple of times him and Hawk just had a good old chin wag about their you know their sovereignty tribal kind of rubbish I zoned out. I don't even remember much of what they talked about. But seriously, there's only so much you can take of 24-7 talk of this crap before you get over it, you know. And the main focus at Gun Yahweh seemed to be with Hale Selassie and in another country. And they're all going round, you know, worshipping another country as being the roots. And even the tribal people want to, you know, be Bob Marley. They don't want to be tribal in, in Australia, they want to be somewhere else. And it seemed like kind of, you know, you do, none of you know what you're doing. But anyway, so let's move on because uh, I'm trying to keep this down and not make them all long. But I have to explain a certain amount of this because um, <laughs> I love these ones. <laughs> He's just, his glasses, I mean, seriously, yeah. You probably say, why would I believe a single word this guy says? Well, uh, gut instinct. Uh, I just knew it was the case. I mean, everything about this guy was wrong to begin with. And it, the things that he was coming out with, I mean, it was like a glitch in the program because before that he was you know, pretending to be all these other things. And this was as a very distinctive glitch in the program. That's why he told me, you know, you're one of them. He thinks he's filling in his replacement and he's going off for his four weeks train, uh, eight weeks training with Paul. You know, and Paul's really great. He's one of the best remote viewers there is. And he taught him everything he knows. So the CIA... A involvement that's been in the area since the 70s. This guy's telling me that over the last 20 years every single alternative community has been infiltrated. Would you find that a stretch of the imagination to believe if the CIA are involved? Controlled narratives. They are all controlled narratives and I can tell you that this guy did little things at Ganyawe that frustrated efforts, you know, that could never be brought back on him directly, but, you know, I knew it was him, sneaky little weasel. So, yes, if you want to um, go back and find out all the details on that, I just wanted to explain that the depth of the controlled narrative that's going on 
in your area if you are in the Northern Rivers area and especially if you're dealing with this cult up there that call themselves Nightcap on Minjimbu, um, they have been infiltrated. They are running controlled narratives. And Max Egan is one of those controlled narratives. Now, let's just have a little bit of a look here at what Kenneth Keith used to be his good buddy. Um, Max told me himself he has experienced extreme childhood trauma. Even now, however, I will not get into the details of what he told me. There is every reason to be curious about Max's past given his actions and affiliations today. What I know for sure is trauma-based mind control is a matter of public record and Max appears to be a man possessed and now incapable of rational and logical thought, at least in my case. Now, that was from Ken O'Keefe. Now, they were best mates and Max sold out his mate, put him under the bus before uh, um, pretty much <laughs> he was revealed as a fake and a fraud and a scam artist. So, and oh look, oh he's not a fake and a fraud. The man is hiding behind a fake name. He doesn't even present himself in real life as a real person. He presents himself as that personality. He's hiding from something. Or is he just a character that is uh, an NK Ultra, um, an MK Ultra narrative? Is he running a program? I think we can safely say now that there are people running programs whether they're controlled by somebody else or it's a narrative that they've created their self to hide their real persona. I mean, there are, once you scrape the surface of some people, you really do start to wonder and ask a lot of questions. Like, I um, don't think uh, ex-US military Ken O'Keefe is that on the up and up but I do think that the the questions that he brings out about Zen Gardner and how uh, Max protected somebody you know for remaining silent you know sexual abuse and all the morality of you know oh, well I wasn't involved with it I just sat back and watched you know so he does make some good points but the thing was that none of anything that what Ken O'Keefe was could ever bring out anything against Max Egan because Richie Allen and Max Egan and all the other controlled narratives set out to support that one overall perspective and just push any other, you know, what Ken O'Keefe says is a lie, what Max Egan says is the truth. Well, I think that half of what Ken O'Keefe says is the truth and none of pretty much what Max Egan says is the truth. I mean, uh, Ken O'Keefe too, I'm pretty sure that O'Keefe is not his last name either. He's got a fake name. So, I mean, they're all hiding behind something fake, aren't they? So, this is Max Egan that is extremely uh, traumatised from childhood experiences trauma-based mind control it's already something that I know uh, it's something yes I will say I know it it's why I've been on this and if the nightcap community the cult up there is wondering why I'm giving you such a hard time you can thank Ganyawa you can thank Alan Hamer and you can thank Max Egan because they're playing games that I don't know how much all the other cult members are involved with, but 
Let's have a look at who the members of the cult are. Just hold on and I'll bring that up. Now, this is the um, this is a little copy of what came out of the uh, PDF sent from the realtor, Rich Mate, uh, about from the Planet Consultants, the five owners. Well, four owners, five addresses. All right, so... So we've got uh, Kemp Cove. Now, according to LinkedIn, Peter Van Lyshout says he's a director at Kemp Cove. Next ones are Peter Van Lyshout, Dolph Cook, Dolph Cook, and Darko Kovac. These three here, they are all joint owners of that property. The ones highlighted in blue are the three lots that were on the original DA 06105 point one the lots now that they're after is all the others which is a considerable amount more so then we go down to Zimmerland now Zimmerland is associated with Derek Zillman I know this because of the judgment summary in the Supreme Court and Wollumbin Horizons now these three, um, Derek Zillman, Mark McMurtry and Adrian Brannock, uh, are all associated with other companies. I'm not going to get too much into the companies they're involved with right now because that's still um, all getting put together. And, uh, yes, I'm going to go behind the paywall and search directly for more accurate information before I say too much on that. So the top row is all the developers involved in it. And we are, see, Nightcap Village Developer, AB Adrian Brennock. And down here, also, Mark McMurtry, Nightcap Developer. So that's why he's up on the developers line these two are up there because they're self-confessed developers and associated with the companies the different member companies that are holding different and maneuvering around different ways now the next row down we've got the promoters the first three ones are the promoters Richard Moat, Imon Lowe, Michaela Lowe Michaela Lowe runs Ren Realty and her husband, Imon, um, is the salesman there pretty much. And Richard Moat runs the Nightcap Realty, now out of the now not running Sphinx Rock Cafe. And then we've got Philip Dixon, Steve McSween. And I added Christy Brannock in here, uh, Adrian's wife, because uh, she's a member too. There's just nothing on her. Um, then we've got the promoters. Like this one is the promoters' real estaters. These ones are more the public face promoters, bring the people in to the project. So we've got. Pete Evans, Tyler Tolman, Don Tolman, and Max Egan. Now, Bina Pownall, uh, whose actual name is Gregory Pownall, uh, was the one who wrote the, um, basically, the code of ethics that everyone's expected to live by. Now, on the bottom rung here, we've got the three uh, elders. Mark Cora, Dean Rodimer, and Uncle Artie. Now, let me just show you. Hang on. At the very core of the community structure is the discretionary trust, which issues uh, you get issued a certificate in, 
and it entitles you to the automatic uh, into the incorporated association and the outerlying proprietary limited companies that feed all back in through and allowing to for member companies to also feed back in through that way. And this is by the definition of their own uh, information about how they've set this up. I'm not surmising this, this is how they're saying it's done. So the um, two organisational representatives for the Minjimbal Tribal Discretionary Trust is Dean Rodimer and Mark Cora. So we go back to our little image. Hang on. And we find that this is Mark Cora and Dean Rodimer. So ultimately, at the very core of the structure and all the money that feeds back to the members, you have these two here that are ultimately said to control all the money. But apparently nobody can actually know who the members are. They're all anonymous. Well, these people are not anonymous. And the interesting thing is that um, at the very base level where you are given that certificate of title in the discretionary trust that automatically um, puts you into the incorporated association and links you up. Now it was said in the video recreating the village with Adrian Brennock describing his three-tier system very clearly that you, you know if the bank came in and said all right you haven't paid your money we're going to take the land back they can't take the land back all they can take is a piece of paper and that's worthless we'll just issue AB with another one because we like him. Well here's a little bit of a tricky thing. Now that piece of paper that you said you just handed over to the bank is actually the whole base foundation into the discretionary trust that entitles you to automatic membership into the incorporated association and all the member companies and everything. So when you say that, well, I give them a piece of paper and it's worthless, actually, no, it's not. You've just given them a share in the discretionary trust and everything else that is connected to it and a right to the profits because that certificate is a certificate of membership into the discretionary trust that allows you to be pretty much a long-term renter on land that was gifted to people that isn't even owned yet to give to them. But, you know, there's a lot more I'm going to go into these things because there's some interesting stories that went on, on in the Gold Coast too about um, someone trying to set up sovereignty after they borrowed money from perpetual trustees and uh, didn't want to pay it back and tried setting up a sovereignty claim. And that's how they ended up bankrupt and also the tax man not being very happy with them. So that's just your um, <laughs> nightcap on Minjimbal cult members uh, that's involved with it. Now, if they'd like to correct me, oh, please feel free to correct me on anything that I may have not got right. I'm always open to correcting facts that I haven't got right. Well, not all of them are facts, but then if you're on this list, you're going to need to give me something pretty well <laughs> convincing other than just bullshit out of your mouth, okay? Prove it. Prove I'm wrong. 
I mean, so far none of them can. They're all just keeping on sticking their foot in their mouth. But that's a story for another time. I wanted to introduce the controlled narratives. This community has got at least one controlled narrative. I'd say several of them are controlled narratives. And it's a curious thing too that um, a few weeks ago after a um, comment that was made by Max there was a lot of people that came out and got a little bit pissed off with him because he seemed to um, support Freemasons and there was a yeah, a lot of people speaking out, reckoning he was one because he was protecting them. And it was like, well, you know, he's protected Zen Gardner and he's one. You know, come on, he's got to be. And uh, ultimately, I'd say that uh, Max Egan, false name, is uh, a Freemason as well. So not only a controlled narrative, and probably by the CIA. You know, somebody asked me, who do you think's controlling them? At the very minimum, I think it would be the CIA. At the very maximum, well, we could certainly go a lot of places with that, couldn't we? <laughs> but I'm not. I just uh, wanted to put the players out there that uh, you're dealing with. Like this guy here, hasn't he got a wonderful picture? He actually left a comment calling me a meth head. <laughs> now, I'm telling you, if he wanted to put up that freaky deaky art to make himself look like a meth head, and he's calling me one, it's kind of like, well... I think it's a bit too close to home, you know. I think actually some of them might actually exhibit a lot of signs of um, erratic behaviour, poppy eyes, speedy, jittery talk. There are certain people that uh, do that. Start listening. You can hear certain people are on things more than just yeah, high on their own ego. They're high on something else. Is that an accusation I'm making? Hmm. I'll tell you what. Go get a drug test and prove me wrong. <laughs> I don't think you'd want to, though. There'd be too many cocktails, wouldn't there? So, I think I've said enough for today and I'll cut it off there. And uh, catch you next time.